Well, I hope you're all enjoying day two of Mises University, or I, I guess day three if we count the opening night festivities. I know I'm having a good time enjoying talking to many of you about markets and competition. And you know, you may have the impression from listening to some of the lectures that uh, Austrian economists are the only thinkers, the only writers who have anything positive to say about markets. Right? We talk about these other economists, these bad people, you know, who, uh, uh, who, who have a different take on how markets work uh, than the Austrians do. But, you know, it really isn't the case that all non-Austrian economists are hostile to markets. I mean, you, of course, you have a few, you know, crazy Marxists and the weird sorts of people I interact, interact with on social media uh, who think that markets are completely bad and wrong and we should replace them all with... Uh, with governmental decision making. But actually most economists, even those who are not trained in the Austrian tradition, you know, they do see positives in markets, right? They think that markets are good at accomplishing certain things. In fact, they would probably say that, yeah, markets are pretty good for producing most goods and services, you know, shoes, toothpaste, computers, automobiles, et cetera, kind of mundane, everyday goods and services. Yeah, we probably don't want the government put in charge of toothpaste uh, or, or, or shoes. We, we see some reasons why that, you know, we see some drawbacks. But let's not go overboard, right? There, there are certain things that markets don't do well, and for these things, we need some kind of intervention, policy intervention, uh, to fix them. For example, uh, markets don't incorporate external benefits and costs, so-called externalities. Uh, uh, they don't, uh, we don't necessarily have a price that incorporates all of the potential spillovers, positive and negative. That can lead to undesirable or suboptimal market outcomes. Uh, markets aren't good at supplying certain kinds of goods and services, so-called public goods like education, healthcare, law, police, defense, and so forth. So we need the state to fund these public goods through taxation and then provide them to anybody whether you want them or not. Uh, basic science has become, in recent decades, one of those so-called public goods that gets a lot more attention. I'll talk about that a little bit more in my later lecture in the week uh, when we discuss big tech. Uh, and finally, there's the claim that, well, on an unregulated competitive free market, things might be okay for a while, but eventually there's a tendency uh, for monopoly power to emerge, right? One firm will outcompete a bunch of other firms until it gets super large, and maybe we might only have one firm dominating the entire industry, Amazon, Walmart, etc. and we need to rein those firms in to keep them from abusing their so-called monopoly position. So we need a body of antitrust law, we need competition policy in the form of regulation and so forth uh, to make, to sort of correct these errors in market outcomes. So these are all examples of what your professor might call market failure. So you probably heard your professor say, well, markets are fine, but we need government to intervene to correct market failures. Um, I want to talk in particular about this last point, the claim that left to their own devices, markets will produce uh, there, there's a tendency for monopolies to emerge and that we need to do something about them. In order to have competitive markets, many economists believe, we need the government to play an active role in keeping markets competitive. What do they mean by competitive? Let's think about the, the word competition, right? I mean, in everyday language, a competition refers to some kind of a... Um, a uh, a state of affairs in which one or more parties are competing to beat each other in some kind of a contest, right? So we think about competitions in sports or a competition in school. Uh, this is a photo from a few years back at Mises U of a really intense chess competition between Tom Woods and Walter Block, both of whom, uh, in, in addition to being very accomplished libertarian scholars, are also uh, very good chess players. Um, we also use the word competitive, you know, as an adjective to say, well, you know, that contest was particularly competitive, right? So me versus, you know, LeBron James in one-on-one -on -one would not be super competitive, but me versus some other old out-of-shape guy might be more competitive, okay? So if it's more even, uh, we refer to that process or contest as being more 
competitive. So, you know, this is just sort of the ordinary language notion of what it, what it means to compete. It refers to rivalry or a situation in which rivals are trying to best each other to achieve some outcome or some goal. Now, if you were paying attention to the judge's lecture last night, as I'm sure you all were, you might have noticed him uh, in his discussion of the Interstate Commerce Clause. He said, right, the states were prohibited from uh, imposing trade barriers, tariffs on interstate commerce, and were also, the idea was for the states to be prevented from creating monopolies. Did you catch that? Now, what was meant at the time by creating a monopoly, it did not mean allowing a firm to get 75% market share, right? That's not what a monopoly meant. The common law, natural law notion of monopoly is an exclusive grant by the state to one particular operator, right? If, uh, what was the, the example was um, uh, talking about chairs, right? Manufacturing chairs in, in one part of New Jersey and sending them to another part of New Jersey. Wasn't it chairs? Uh, you know, if, if the state of New Jersey were to say only um, Maxwell, here in the front row. Only Maxwell is allowed to produce chairs with four legs made out of wood. If anyone else tries to produce a chair and bring it to market, that person will be fined or imprisoned, right? Then we would say Maxwell has a monopoly on the production of that type of chair. Okay, so having an exclusive license, a grant of special privilege, uh, even a patent can function as a legal monopoly in this sense. Right? That's what people in the 18th century and in the common law tradition understood monopoly to mean. Among economists, particularly in the last uh, 100 years, the, 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 the term competition has been, and been transformed to mean something else. Right? So when mainstream economists talk about a competitive market, they don't mean a market in which one or more firms are engaged in some sort of rivalry, trying to outcompete the other firms. They mean a firm that has a particular, uh, particular structure. There's a certain number of firms in the market behaving a certain way. You probably heard of so-called perfect competition, which we'll discuss in a moment, and how any deviation from that represents imperfect competition, a, a, a sort of less than desirable state of affairs, right? So in, in sort of neoclassical economists, uh, a market is competitive if there are so many firms competing against each other that no firm has the ability to charge a price higher than the price that just covers its cost. So the ability to raise price over marginal cost is taken as a sign of monopoly power or so-called market power uh, in, in, in any particular market. You see a lot of discussion today about uh, trying to measure these markups empirically using various statistical tools. And we look at the average markups in this industry or that to determine whether those industries are competitive or not, whether the entire US economy is more or less competitive, and so forth. So let me uh, briefly review these more mainstream treatments of monopoly and competition and then explain what Austrians, how Austrians have approached this issue, because as you can imagine, uh, the Austrian approach has been rather different. How many of you seen, have seen a picture like this in your econ class? Yeah, lots of hands going up, right? This is the way uh, economics textbooks describe what they call a, uh, this is a firm under conditions of perfect competition. Okay, so what is, what, is the, what, is the, uh, what is the situation facing a perfectly competitive firm? Well, the demand for this firm's product is not the usual downward sloping demand curve, right? But it's rather a demand curve that's horizontal or perfectly elastic, meaning that this firm is in competition with so many other firms in the same market producing identical or near identical products that a consumer will not pay one penny more for your product than the product of one of your rivals. There's no, differenti no, no differentiation by consumers uh, 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 among, uh, across different sellers, and so no firm can charge a price higher than what any other firm charges. So there's a market, right? There's a market for this product as a whole with supply and demand curves determining the market price. And then every firm can sell as many products or as few products at the market price without affecting that price. Okay, so the, so the marginal revenue, the revenue from selling an additional unit of the good or service is just equal to the price. You can never charge higher than the market price. You wouldn't want to charge lower than the market price. 
Okay, so firms face this horizontal, perfectly elastic demand curve. Given a marginal cost and average cost curve, right, the firm will choose to maximize profit, at least in the short run, but by, by choosing a quantity, remember you can't choose a price, the price is given to you by the market. So you choose a quantity such that, you know, where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. The, the additional revenue, the price from selling one more unit is exactly equal to the cost of producing that marginal unit that yields a, that, that quantity is represented on this graph by QPC, the perfectly competitive quantity. The, the price is given by market conditions, the perfectly competitive price. Uh, and in the long run, firms earn zero economic profit when they are in facing conditions of perfect competition, right? Because you, you've probably heard this story, right? If a firm, uh, if the market price happens to be above the minimum of that average total cost curve or average cost curve, then firms will earn revenues in excess of their costs, but that will induce other firms to enter the market. It's assumed that entry and exit are costless. Right? So a firm will, uh, uh, new firms will enter, that will drive the market price down by shifting the supply curve to the right. The market price will fall until it just touches the bottom of that average cost curve. And if the market price happens to be below the minimum of average cost, then firms will be losing money, and so firms will exit, shifting the supply curve in the industry to the left until that price rises to where it just touches the bottom of that average total cost curve. Uh, According to your professor, this is great. This is, a, this is the world we want to live in, right? We have perfect, uh, perfect productive efficiency because firms are producing at the minimum of their average total cost curve, so they're not wasting any inputs. We have perfect allocative efficiency because every price, is, every good is bought and sold in the market at a price just equal to marginal, the marginal cost of producing it. So society would not be better off if those resources were shifted to some other use. So we have sort of total, total bliss. Okay, this is, this is the world we want, the world of the perfectly competitive firm. But wait, your professor will say, sadly, tragically, the real world is not like this. Okay, in reality, it's not the case that every firm sells a perfectly identical product. I happen to have this delicious chocolate chip cookie from Chick-fil-A that I saved. There are other chocolate chip cookies that you can buy on the market, but they're not all the same. Uh, I, personally, I don't think the Chick-fil-A cookies are all that great, but my family members think the Chick-fil-A cookies are way better than the cookies you can get at most other cookie stores, right? So we disagree on that, right? So in the real world, sellers do have the ability to, to charge a higher price than some other seller if consumers can be, I guess, fooled into believing that their product is somehow unique. So at the other extreme, imagine a world in which a single firm controls the entire market. This firm has so-called market power and can charge a monopoly price, right? So there's a downward sloping demand curve facing that uh, for, for that firm. And there's a downward sloping marginal revenue curve associated with that demand curve. And if you remember from your micro class, the marginal revenue curve is more steeply sloped than the demand curve and lies a little bit to the left. So this firm chooses the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, where the blue line hits the green line, that's QM. That's the quantity that this monopolist will produce. What, what price will the monopolist charge? Not the price where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Rather, that devious monopolist will sneak all the way up to the demand curve Right, and charge a price PM, the highest price the market will bear. To, that's the highest price at which you can sell the quantity QM. And so look at that blue trapezoid shape. That is pr what they call producer surplus or profit. Monopoly profit that accrues to the monopolist. Uh, the consumers get a little bit of so-called consumer surplus, that, that pink triangle. But there's that nefarious yellow area, right? what they call deadweight loss, that represents you know, sort of consumer surplus that the consumers would have gotten if this market was perfectly competitive uh, and is not captured by the monopolist in terms of profit. It's just like wasted. It's squandered, right? So, there, so even apart from the fact that in, in this world, monopolists can make money, and that's bad, and consumers pay a higher price than they otherwise would have, that's also bad. And the quantity produced is less 
than the quantity that would have been produced under perfect competition. That's, that's even more bad, right? You also have this magical uh, deadweight loss, this sort of benefit that sort of disappears into the ether. Okay, so this is terrible, according to your professor. We've got to do everything in our power to prevent this from happening, right? We don't want firms to restrict their output below the perfectly competitive level so they can jack up the price and make out like bandits. So uh, in, in the sort of standard approach and the approach that has been embraced by most economists and by most antitrust courts and by the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission and their equivalents in other countries, right? Policy should be designed to take markets that look like this and make them into markets that look like this. Okay, the goal of competition policy is to make actual markets work more like the perfectly competitive market of the, of the textbook. Okay, that's what so-called competition policy is all about. Raise your hand if you've seen this and if you studied this in school before. Yeah, lots of you have, most of you have. So what's wrong with it? I mean, lots of things are wrong with it. Um, Austrians have made a number of sort of fundamental critiques of the assumptions of this model, right? So first of all, this notion that there could ever be such a thing as a perfectly elastic demand curve is also makes no sense in the in the world of actual in the world of human action, in the world of purposeful human action by you know by by, by people on this earth acting in real markets. Right? Action is discrete and non-continuous. Uh, there, there are no infinitesimally small units of, of output that you can sell or withhold to the market. Uh, you know, every seller contributes some discrete quantity of output to the market, which will have some impact on the market price, however small. I mean, if you, I don't know if, if your professor was really transparent about this, but the assumption under perfect competition is not that there are a lot of firms, you know, like 20 or 100. It, it, it's, a, it's a model of the mathematical limit, right? So the model says price will be equal to marginal cost in the limit when the number of firms is, guess how many? Infinity. Yeah, so as the number of firms increases, the demand curve becomes more elastic and the price approaches marginal cost and in the limit, all of those things hold. So in the limit, the number of firms is infinity, and the quantity that each firm produces contributes to market output is zero. I've never shopped at a company like that. I don't know if you have, but that's really what this model is, is sort of talking about. So of course, that does, makes no sense from a praxeological point of view. You know, there's also a point, sort of a, a, a normative point uh, you know, th this, th remember the idea is that under, under monopoly, the market is producing less output than what it somehow should produce, right? The monopolist r restricts output to be able to charge a higher price, you know, to sort of to travel up that downward sloping demand curve, which, you know, s seems unjust or unfair somehow. But um, you know, Murray Rothbard made this point too, that... Um, you know, in, in sort of requiring the firm to produce more than what the owner of the firm wants to produce, you know, this sort of, it's sort of a weird property rights violation. You know, it's easy to see this when we use the example of, you know, the celebrity who has a monopoly on his or her image and labor and so forth. You know, for example, to use my doppelganger, George Clooney. <laughs> what can I say? Um, you know, if, if you take the monopoly argument seriously, you would say, you know, George Clooney should be working 16 hours a day. He can sleep for eight, right? But he needs to make a movie every single week. I mean, it's unfair that he only makes a certain number of movies per year because he wants to protect his reputation or because he's lazy, right? He might earn less per movie if he continually made movies, uh, but he chooses to withhold some of his labor fr from us and go off to you know Monte Carlo or wherever those guys go, right? And uh, so and then he could charge a higher price for his services. That's that's we should we should put him in chains, and drag him to the movie studio and compel him to make a movie every single day, right? That would violate his individual sovereignty, right? That would violate his sovereignty as a human being. You know, from the point of view of Austrian welfare economics, we would say that's a 
you know, that, that's introducing a, a unjustified harm on George Clooney, right? That's lowering societal well-being somehow by compelling him to do something he doesn't want to do. Well, how is it really any different from saying, well, if, if the book market were perfectly competitive, this many copies of Peter Klein's books would be sold, a really big number, right? But because Amazon holds this near monopoly on books, you know, it's only selling this many copies so that it can jack up the price. We should compel the firm to produce not the quantity it wants, QM, but the quantity we want, QC. Well, isn't that just a violation of the owners of the firm's property rights? Is the same way it would be with George Clooney, right? Um, another thing to keep in mind is, you know, the elasticity of demand, you know, that's a characteristic of the demand curve. That itself reflects consumer preferences. So sometimes you hear, uh, you hear your professors say, well, in you know market for tobacco or some highly specialized good, you know, the demand curve is really inelastic, and that allows the sellers to charge a higher price and rip people off, blah, blah, blah. I mean, elasticity is, is the result of consumer preference, right? Consumers can choose to have whatever kind of demand curve they want. I mean, if the demand curve is highly inelastic, it means consumers perceive this good to have few close substitutes, right? The existence of close substitutes is not something given by God or nature, right? That is a reflection of human preference. So people could choose to consider something else a substitute, uh, or they could, you know, they could rightly choose that Peter Klein books have no substitute because of their intrinsic, intrinsic quality. Okay. Um, now, Mises has a very interesting discussion of monopoly in several of his writings, including in Human Action, but also in some standalone essays that were, that were published within the last 20 years. Um, uh, Mises, Mises did think that monopoly, Mises thought monopoly could arise on the free market, but only under special circumstances, and that it was very unlikely for these circumstances to obtain. So Mises held that, okay, you do have some cases where you've got a, a single seller of a unique good, you know, De Beers, selling diamonds or something like that, right? Or maybe you have a cartel of sellers acting as a single decision maker, and the demand for the good is inelastic above the price that would have obtained in a competitive market. Uh, then the price that will be charged is not consistent with the working out of consumer sovereignty, right? So, uh, in the absence of a single seller or a seller's cartel, a lower price would have obtained on the market. And so Mises thought consumer sovereignty was sort of violated in this specific case. Consumers were not getting the pattern of goods and services produced consistent with their preferences because of this sort of unusual set of circumstances. Mises did think that these circumstances were highly unusual. And he also said, look, in practice, there's really no way to discern whether monopoly conditions obtain or not. It's just sort of a theoretical uh, uh, distinction. The theorist, according to Mises, can distinguish the monopoly price from the competitive price and can point out that under these special conditions, consumer sovereignty would not obtain. Rothbard's treatment of monopoly starts with Mises' analysis but then adds some further refinements. So Rothbard points out, look, uh, all sellers face a downward sloping demand curve, right? There's no such thing as a perfectly elastic demand curve. And so once you recognize that, there's, there's really not any way even theoretically to distinguish a monopoly price from a competitive price in the absence of a state-granted monopoly privilege. As Rothbard pointed out, I mean, all, all entrepreneurs Right? All firm owners try to achieve the highest level of profit they think is possible, given their estimates of future consumer demands. You know, we talked about that yesterday. Right? And all firms will actually charge a price that's in the elastic range of their demand curve. Right? Because if the price were inelastic, if, if, if where you were pricing was in the inelastic part of the demand curve, you would charge a higher price. Because then, remember, when demand is inelastic, increasing the price means that total revenue goes up, right? You're producing fewer units, so your total cost will go down. It'd be a no-brainer, right? So all firms, whether deemed competitive or monopolistic, 
will all price in the inelastic, uh, in the elastic range of their demand curve. And as we just pointed out, elasticity is voluntary anyway. So there's really no way even theoretically to distinguish a monopoly price from a competitive price, according to Rothbard, in the absence of legal restrictions. Now, what about these legal restrictions? Well, I mean, right, if you have a patent, if I have a patent on this little gadget here for clicking to the next slide, then no one else can produce a product that performs the same function as this product. And we had a good discussion at lunch about some of the weaknesses in the standard sort of patent arguments. Grants, licenses, charters, and so forth would be another example. Uh, occupational licensing is a favorite example of uh, monopoly privilege. Right, the American Medical Association and various other prof uh, professional lobbying groups in the, in the medical industry fight very hard to make it illegal for you know uh, for you to go to the Walmart pharmacy and have them uh, write you a prescription for some ailment. Okay, so lawyers, of course, do this. Professors do it. I mean, it's justified there, right? Because we got to protect the public from bad lectures. Right, so you have to be licensed and have a PhD and all that. Um, trade, trade barriers can also be a, a source of monopoly power, right? Tariffs and quotas that limit or, or, or completely restrict imports of particular competing foreign goods can be interpreted as a kind of monopoly protection for domestic firms. Um, so so uh, according to Rothbard, this is the kind of monopoly that we need to analyze and think about and, 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 and uh, uh, about which we have some serious concern. So, I mean, how does this translate into sort of the policy, policy sphere? So if you look at the history of antitrust law and competition policy, when, um, you know, when academics and, and, and judges and, and, and law professors started thinking about this seriously, 1940s, 1950s, there emerged a particular uh, approach or paradigm for understanding competition that was called the structure conduct performance paradigm. Uh, Joseph Bain was a famous economist in the 1950s who wrote a number of books articulating uh, the structure conduct performance paradigm. And, what it, and the argument was uh, market structure, the structure of the market by which uh, Bain meant the number of firms in the market, the elasticity of the demand curve facing each firm, the degree of monopoly power as we described it a few pictures ago, right? That determines the conduct of firms in the market. So if a firm has a very large market share, right, it's, it, will, that, it will charge a higher price than the competitive price. So conduct follows from structure, and then the performance of that market in terms of well-being for consumers and producers follows from that conduct. So by charging a price higher than marginal cost, consumers are made worse off than they otherwise would be. Uh, the firm able to charge that monopoly price is better off uh, than it otherwise would be. So structure determines conduct, conduct determines performance. And therefore, policy should focus on structure, okay? So policy should focus on uh, eliminating the conditions that give rise to firms having market power or having monopoly power. So if we see that a firm has a large market share, the more astute of you may be wondering, how large? Oh, you know, 60%. Okay, why not 59? Why not 61? Don't ask that question, right? So if a firm has a certain share of the market, then the government needs to do, well, so uh, an, an antitrust court, an antitrust judge or jury could order that this firm be broken up. Okay, we could say Facebook, you must divest Instagram, uh, Google your, you know, your advertising business and your cloud storage business and your and Gmail and so forth all have to be split up into legally independent companies. Or the bureaucrats might, uh, the judge might say, well, okay, we'll allow you to stay as one company, but uh, we're going to regulate the prices that you can charge, or we're going to enjoin certain, uh, we're going to restrict certain kinds of behavior. Right, so the idea is if we, can, uh, if we can fix the structure of the market, then we can eliminate the conduct that's leading to poor performance for consumers. Okay, that was the old, uh, th that was sort of the mainstream view in antitrust really until the 60s and 70s. So uh, in the 60s and 70s, there, were, uh, there was a wave or several waves of very powerful intellectual critique 
not necessarily from Austrians, though Austrians had been offering these critiques uh, as well. But I mean, let's be honest, it wasn't really the thinking of the Austrians that changed how, uh, how antitrust agencies and how antitrust courts approached, and I, uh, approached these issues. It was, some, it was some more mainstream challenges. So the so-called transaction cost perspective associated with people like Oliver Williamson argued that some of the, um, some of the anti, supposedly anti-competitive vertical supply chain uh, behaviors like vertical integration, right, a firm owning its own suppliers and owning its own distributors, uh, resale price maintenance, a, a, a seller, a, a wholesaler telling a retailer, you cannot charge below a certain price if you sell our product. Or uh, territorial restrictions, like a franchise owner saying, you can only have a certain number of Chick-fil-A's in Auburn. You can't have two Chick-fil-A's right next to each other. Chick-fil-A, uh, the Chick-fil-A uh, uh, corporate office would, would decide where the franchise outlets can be. Those kind of vertical restrictions and vertical restraints were considered under the structure conduct performance paradigm, you know, per se evidence of anti-competitive behavior, right? They were seen as means to achieve sort of more control and power by the dominant firm, and they were seen as an exercise of monopoly privilege that needs to be eliminated. And Williamson and others pointed out that, no, if you think about it, a lot of those vertical restrictions actually improve the efficiency of the supply chain. Okay, vertical integration can be a more effective way of procuring inputs. It can induce certain, you know, certain kinds of investments where there's mutual dependency among different stages, right? The manufacturer is more likely to invest in uh, specializing, you know, tailoring its product to a particular downstream distributor and vice versa when they're sort of locked into each other when they can't easily break that relationship and go their own separate ways. So these kind of restrictive contracts that limit vertical competition can be ways of increasing efficiency. And they should not be regarded as anti-competitive, at least not on their face. Um, let's, not, let's give due credit to the Chicago School and even what some people call the UCLA School. So um, uh, Robert Bork is the most famous Chicago School economist. Uh, really, he was a jurist but who was very influential uh, in, in, the, in uh, an affecting antitrust policy in the 1980s and 1990s. People like Harold Demsetz and Yale Brosen, who made the point, for example, with the certain obviously correct point, that it's often the case that the reason a firm has a large market share is because it's better. I mean, it produces stuff that consumers like more than the other, the other uh, firms. Right, that large market share, the ability to charge a so-called monopoly price and earn monopoly profits is not just, you know, it's not the result of some evil conspiracy, right? It could be the case that that firm just outcompeted its rivals. It's just better. You know, when, when I was growing up, uh, when I was a kid in the 80s, you know, every year the NBA championship was won by the Lakers or the Celtics. It's like, okay, well, does that, was there some kind of weird cartel? No, I mean, they were just better. They had Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, uh, Celtics and Lakers, respectively. They were just the two best teams. They were way better than every other team in the NBA. And so, of course, they were in the finals every year. Um, why is Walmart the world's largest retailer? Well, because Sam Walton was one of the most uh, influential and innovative entrepreneurs in U.S. history. Right? Sometimes when I talk to students about this, why, is Walmart, why does Walmart have such a large market share? Because it charges really low prices. Who can compete with that? Okay, well, why, does it, why is it able to charge really low prices? Because it's huge. Okay, no, wait a minute. That's a, that's a chicken and egg. That's a circular argument, right? The, how did Walmart get to be large? Because Sam Walton was a genius at sort of supply chain and logistics activities. Right? He, he came up with this model that, you know, in the old model, you had warehouses scattered around in different places, you know, for groceries and retail items, and they would send stuff on trucks to stores. Sam Walton figured out, no, instead of thinking about each individual store as being sort of its own thing, let's make the unit of analysis be the network, where a network is a, a distribution center and then a set of retail outlets around that distribution center. And we organize our network where we place we organize our system where we place these networks of distribution hub and retail stores in certain places. 
so that each store in that little network will be able to get goods and services at a lower wholesale price, which it can then pass along to consumers, than the standalone discount store or grocer. Or uh, th there were more centralized models used by companies like Kmart and Sears. Basically, Sam Walton outcompeted his rivals, including mom and pops. And that's why Walmart came to be the world's largest retailer. I mean, do we want to punish Walmart and say, because you are more efficient than your rivals, uh, we therefore are going to place some restrictions on you because you're harming consumers? I mean, look, I, I, I like many of you, I feel some, I have this sort of nostalgic attachment to the little, little village shops that I remember from my youth Okay, you could walk downtown and there's the little store and you could go hang out with the proprietor and that's great. Um, uh, does that mean that public policy should assure that that particular kind of market still exists? Should we punish the Walmarts and the Amazons and the other retailers that sell you more and better stuff at lower prices than the mom and pop? Well, I mean, you're free to patronize the mom and pop all you want. Not many people do. Right? If you want to set up like a little Disney World, you can, you can role play, you know, gram, grandpa shopping at the corner store. Nobody's stopping you from doing that. Okay, but the majority of consumers would prefer the ability to get better quality and quantity at a lower price by patronizing a, a large national or global retailer. Um, so when I was a graduate student in the late 80s and early 90s, I was taught that the structure conduct performance paradigm was kind of old-fashioned and displaced. Nobody believes that old stuff anymore. Well, guess what? The structure conduct performance paradigm has come roaring back in the last decade or so uh, with what some people call neo-Brandeisian antitrust, named after Lewis Brandeis, or more pejoratively, hipster antitrust. So so-called hipster antitrust is a return to the old days where, where the, the main thing you focus on is market share. If a firm is big, if it has big market share, it's bad. Big is bad and needs to be eliminated. Uh, uh, President Biden's uh, new Federal Trade Commission chair, Lena Kahn, is one of the leading spokespersons for the so-called hipster antitrust perspective. So it's kind of like the old heavy-handed structure conduct performance paradigm with a twist. So here's the twist, right? In the, in the old antitrust regime, the goal was always to uh, protect the well-being of consumers, to increase so-called consumer welfare. So the thing that uh, courts would look for as evidence that there's something wrong there's some monopoly condition that needs to be dealt with, is prices that are too high, is high prices. Okay, well, the hipsters realized that, wait a minute, we can't go after Amazon, Walmart, Google, Facebook for doing consumer harm in the form of pricing because either with you know, Walmart or Amazon, the prices are lower than those of the rivals or with most of the tech platforms, you get the stuff for free. Okay, so how do you show that consumers are harmed by giving them access to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth at a price of zero? I mean, it's very, it's, it, by the traditional consumer welfare standard, there's not any consumer harm. You, it's, you can't demonstrate any consumer harm. So how would you make an antitrust case or how would you use regulation to limit these platforms? So they said, ah, oh, well, it's not just consumer harm that we should look at. It's harm to anybody. Okay, so if we can show that Amazon uh, doesn't pay its workers enough or makes workers work long hours, you know, and pee in bottles, you've seen all those Amazon sort of scandal stories about Amazon warehouses, uh, that, that is uh, grounds for an antitrust suit. Yeah, I mean, they're not hurting consumers. They're selling stuff to consumers at low prices, but they're harming their workers. They're harming their small suppliers. They're harming the natural environment. They're harming some other stakeholder we can identify somewhere in the universe, right? then we can come down on them hard using antitrust policy. So that's how, how hipster antitrust is both a return to the old way of thinking about antitrust, bi big is bad, and a broadening in that it, allow, it allows for margins of badness sort of everywhere. Any potential stakeholder who is harmed by the firm being large can justify the filing of some kind of competition policy uh, complaint. 
So uh, just uh, a, a little more than a week ago, uh, the Biden administration uh, introduced a, a sweeping set of proposals on improving the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. And I thought it might be interesting to look at that from the point of view of Austrian competition theory, competition monopoly theory. So uh, first, thing to, first thing to note is that uh, the, the, the proposal takes for granted that there is a pressing need for new legislative and executive action on, uh, on competition because the U.S. economy is, less, is getting less competitive. Right, competition is decreasing in the U.S. economy, in the global economy too. Therefore, there is need for some kind of bold policy action. So, what is the argument? What is the evidence for this background assumption of decreasing competition? Well, there are some uh, empirical studies that show that if you look at certain sectors of the U.S. economy and you measure industry in a, a sort of broad way, for those of you geeky types. If you look at you know two-digit two-digit SIC code industries, you find that between you know 2010 and 2020, for many of those industries, uh, the you know the the the, mar the market share held by the four largest firms, so-called C4 concentration index, has gone up in some industries. Not not necessarily by a lot, uh, but 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 uh, but by a little. And of course, we all have plenty of anecdotal evidence. Right, big tech, Facebook has a monopoly. Well, actually, it's weird. Facebook has a monopoly on social media, but so does Twitter, <laughs> and so do a bunch of other platforms too. Um, you know, Amazon has a monopoly on retail, you know, as well as Walmart. And I mean, it's kind of weird if you think about it. But there's certainly a lot of salient examples of firms that seem to dominate their industries, about which you know something allegedly should be done. But actually, if you look at it, um, and, and you remember I talked about markups before, if you try to estimate the gap between price and marginal cost in some sectors, you could show that that, that wedge, that price cost wedge has gone up a little bit. Um, there are two major problems with this. I mean, there are lots of problems with, with just that background assumption. First, if you look broadly throughout the entire economy, it's much more difficult to show that market power or concentration has gone up, as you can, as you, as I've already hinted, you know, it sort of depends on what you define the relevant market to be. Okay, so um, it, you know, if you define the market very narrowly, then certain firms have a really big share of that narrowly defined market. Right? If we define the market as week-long summer Austrian programs in Auburn, Alabama. The Mises Institute, as far as I know, has a 100% market share, okay? If we define the market as education in economics and related topics, then we have a very small market share. So what's the right definition of the market? Yeah. Um, and actually, in many sectors of the economy uh, where, we see, where we do see increased concentration, it's probably more likely due to the fact, you can see this in technology, that you know, so sometimes the sort of technical structure of the industry requires that firms make very large upfront capital investments you know, in inventing the product, in, if it's software, writing the code. Right? So it's really not possible for lots and lots of firms to be competing uh, for this product because it's very hard to make the product in the first place. And once you make it, you can sell additional units at a pretty low price. That market structure naturally lends itself to having a smaller number of competitors, but there's nothing anti-competitive about that if we understand competition correctly. Uh, so if you look at the order itself, and you can look at it yourself, um, there are a few things that I think are actually good in terms of promoting competition. There is some attempt to roll back some occupational licensing protection. For example, there's a, there's a, there's a piece about um, allowing uh, drug stores to sell hearing aids so that you know CVS, Walmart, Walgreens could sell hearing aids over the counter. I think that would be good. That's, that's removing a barrier that allows only certain kinds of medical professionals to pr sort of prescribe hearing aids. Um, but as uh, I'm sure you won't be surprised, there are many things that I think are not so good about this uh, new set of proposals. One is that um, uh, the antitrust authorities would be empowered to re-review and sort of re uh, uh, um, Re-examine and re-litigate previously decided antitrust cases, 
right? So forget about double jeopardy as we were discussing last night. Uh, that would go out the window for companies in antitrust cases. There are requirements of net, so-called net neutrality, which I think is a terrible idea. Um, a lot of attention has gone to prohibiting so-called non-compete agreements, right? Where as a condition of employment, you have to agree that if you leave the firm, you won't go and work for a rival firm. And most economists think non-compete agreements are anti-competitive on their face and should be prohibited, and Biden's uh, proposal uh, uh, would ban non-competes in most sectors. Actually, if you think about it, though, a, non, a, a, a labor, an employment contract with a non-compete agreement is just one particular type of labor contract, right? If you agree not to start your own firm that competes with your employer, or you agree not to go work for a rival firm, then uh, the employer would treat you one way, right? If you refuse to agree to those conditions, then you would be treated a different way. In terms of other aspects of the compensation package, like the wage, like job security, how much they're willing to train you or invest in company-specific training, how much they're willing to give you access to private information and so forth, would all depend on that. But there's no reason why the market can't sort out all of the conditions and features of the contract, including non-compete. There's also, have you heard of this so-called right to repair uh, movement that's been going on for a long time, that, uh, and, and the Biden proposal embraces this idea that manufacturers, you know, they can't void the warranty if you try to fix it yourself. They can't require you to go to a licensed repair shop that they authorize to fix the thing. You have to be able to fix it yourself at home or take it to any repair shop. Again, this is just a weird, I mean, why would we think a contractual restriction on what you can do to it and still be under warranty, why would we think the market can't figure that out? Um, that doesn't make any sense either. Um, and there's some stuff about data portability that's problematic too. So to, to make a long story short, from the Austrian point of view, competition is a process of rivalry among entrepreneurs and capitalists and workers you know, who are free to compete as they see fit within the given legal framework. Now, whether that results in a few firms or many firms, large firms or small firms. I mean, ex ante, we've no, we have no opinion on that whatsoever. Let the market structure be that which emerges under fair, uh, under free, you know, free and open competition, the absence of legal restrictions by the state on competition. Some firms will earn profits, some firms will, will, will earn losses. How, how easy it is to enter, how fast firms can grow, how much innovation you get. I mean, again, this is all stuff that can be worked out on the free market. Uh, government attempts to limit monopoly power or increase competition, in fact, you know, only create barriers to competition properly understood. The best competition policy for the state is not to grant monopoly privilege in the various forms in which we've discussed it. Thank you.